Welcome to the world of materials. My name is Professor Bonnet. In this video, we will first look at different aspects of the time temperature transformation diagram before we will learn how to measure hardness and hardenability curves practically. In the last video tutorial, we learned about the continuous time temperature transformation diagram in detail. Another type of the time temperature transformation diagram is the so-called isothermal time temperature transformation diagram, where cooling is interrupted by isothermal holding. Here, the work pieces are first cooled in a heated salt or lead bath to just above the martensite line MS and then held isothermally, that is to say, at the same temperature. Once the binite transformation has taken place, cooling is continued. Thus, a complete transformation to binite is achieved. Since this type of heat treatment only produces comparatively hard microstructures, the hardness according to Rockwell C is often given. We will learn in the course of the video how this is measured. Even if the aim is generally to achieve a binitic structure, it would also be possible to achieve a conversion to a purely politic structure with somewhat lower hardness for the unalloyed steel C60, shown here as an example. Since all metallic workpieces with which a heat treatment is to be carried out have a finite thickness, the cooling rate naturally varies over the cross-section of the sample. However, if this is to be taken into account and planned, it is necessary to know the cooling curve or cooling rate at the relevant points of the cross-section of a component. Often the cooling curve cannot be measured under operating conditions and must be estimated. For this purpose, the diagram shown can be used from which the cooling parameter lambda for the cooling time of the core or surface from 800 to 500 degrees Celsius can be taken for various diameters when cooled in water. The bold line represents the cooling parameter for the core of a round sample. The cooling parameter lambda denotes the time required to cool a steel specimen from 800 to 500 degrees Celsius expressed in the unit hectoseconds. The specification lambda equals 3, therefore, means that the cooling from 800 to 500 degrees Celsius took about 3 hectoseconds, means 300 seconds, that is 5 minutes. It can thus be read of which cooling time is needed to achieve martensitic hardening and whether through hardening is possible or up to which workpiece depths it can be expected. Corresponding diagrams are also available for cooling in oil or in air. These would show that the cooling times for quenching in oil are about twice as high as in water and that cooling in air is 50 times slower than in oil. With the aid of this cooling parameter or by drawing the measured cooling curve in the time temperature transformation diagram of the respective steel, the cooling process can be followed and it can be read off whether the desired transformation result can be achieved. For this reason, the cooling parameters are also shown in some of the time temperature transformation diagrams. The cooling parameters for the 34CRMO4 shown here are between 0.13 and 1.1 for a purely martensitic binitic transformation. That is to say, cooling times of between 13 and 110 seconds are required for cooling from 800 to 500 degrees Celsius. With slower cooling, the microstructure transforms more and more to ferritic perlitic. At high values for the cooling parameter, greater 9 hectoseconds, especially with air cooling, it is often converted into a cooling rate. Thus, a cooling parameter of 9 corresponds to a cooling rate of 20 uh, degrees Celsius per minute. Hardness is the resistance of a material to the penetration 
of another harder body. In principle, a distinction is made between static and dynamic hardness testing methods. The dynamic test methods abruptly apply the load to the part to be tested. With static methods, the load is constant or gradually increased. Depending on the type of impact, a distinction is made between different types of hardness in both static and dynamic methods. At this point, I would like to mention only the three most important static hardness testing methods that you will encounter in professional life. The Brunel test, the Vickers test and the Rockwell C test. The Brunel hardness test is carried out on soft to medium hard metals, for example, case hardening steel. A carbide ball is used as a test specimen for this method. Depending on the thickness of the workpiece, the balls with a diameter of 1 to 10 mm are used. They are pressed into the surface of the workpiece with a defined force. The surface must be ground flat. Different test forces are used depending on the expected material hardness. The diameter of the impression the test specimen leaves on the surface of the workpiece is measured. The Brunel hardness is defined as the ratio of the test force to indentation surface. The Brunel hardness HB is determined from the following variables. Ball diameter D, applied force F and diameter of the ball indentation small d. The Brunel hardness test was first presented to the public at the World Exhibition in Paris in 1900. The other hardness testing methods presented here were developed shortly afterwards. At that time the test load was not measured in Newton but still in kilopond. Therefore today the test force in Newton is multiplied by 0.102, that is to say the reciprocal of the acceleration due to gravity g of 9.81 to convert the unit of force Newton into the older unit kilopound. The Wickers hardness test is used for thin sheets, thin layers and workpieces made of uniformly structured materials. Here too the surface must be ground flat. The indenter is a four-sided pyramid of diamond with a point angle of 136 degree. The two diagonals of the square indentation are measured and averaged. As in the Brunel hardness test, the indentation surface is calculated from the indentation diameter small d. The test load is varied according to the thickness of the workpiece and the hardness. The ratio of test load to surface results in the Vickers hardness HV. The test load in Newton is again multiplied by 0.102. With 1.8544 as value for sinus 136 degree divided by 2, the Wickers hardness is obtained HV equals 0.102 times F times 1.8544 divided by D square. Rockwell C test can be performed without pretreatment of the surface. A diamond cone with a point angle of 120 degree is used as a test specimen. In order to compensate for the defects caused by an unclean surface, the intender is first pressed into the surface with a test preload F0. The penetration depth generated by the preforce is the starting point for further testing. The test force F1 is applied additionally. After the standardized duration of action, the load is released to the initial force F0. This causes an elastic back deformation. The permanent indentation depth corresponds to the Rockwell hardness HRC. The Jomini test serves to determine the hardenability of steels. Standardized round bar specimens are used for the test. The length is 100 mm 
and the diameter 25 millimeter. All heat treatments require heating the specimen at a controlled rate to the correct temperature and maintaining a certain holding time to achieve a homogeneous austenitic structure. This process is known as austenitization. A quenching device is used for the targeted cooling of the sample at the end phase. It consists of a holder in which the sample can be hung and allows it to be placed centrally by a water jet. The water jet must have a rising height of 65 mm and a diameter of 12.5 mm. A shutter makes it possible to deflect the water jet when the sample is inserted. After the annealing temperature of the sample has been maintained for 30 minutes, the sample can be taken out of the furnace and hung in the quenching device. The time between taking the sample out of the furnace and the start of the quenching process must not be longer than 5 seconds. Now the sample is cooled at the front side for at least 10 minutes. During cooling from the austenitizing temperature, steel in the solid state transformation transforms from the face-centered cubic lattice to the body-centered cubic lattice. During the diffusion-less transformation, during hardening, the carbon remains forcibly dissolved and leads to a very strong tension of the lattice. The high hardness results from this tension in the lattice. The more carbon is dissolved in the lattice, the higher the lattice tension and thus the resulting hardness. After the sample has been sanded on the surface, the hardness test can be performed. This is carried out at several points at fixed intervals. In this way, the hardenability of the steel can be determined. The hardenability is primarily dependent on the carbon content of the alloy and the martensite content. An unalloyed steel sample containing 0.2% carbon has a hardness of 45 HRC when fully converted to martensite. An unalloyed steel sample with 0.8% carbon achieves a much higher hardness of 63 HRC. The higher the carbon content, the greater the hardenability. In the Jomini test, the heat flows off in the direction of the rod axis. The cooling time of the Jomini test is therefore a function of the distance from the end phase. On the end phase, in direction contact with water, the cooling time is extremely short. With increasing distance from the front phase, the cooling duration becomes longer and longer. The hardness results of the Jomini tests are entered into, into a diagram. As an example, the hardenability band for the quenched and tempered steel 34CRM04 is shown here. The solid lines form the upper and lower limits of the scattered band. This diagram shows the re results of the Jomini test for four different materials, which all have a carbon content of approximately 0.35%. When we look at the curse, we can see how significant the influence of even small amounts of alloying elements can be on the hardenability of a steel. You will learn more about hardening and other specific heat treatment processes in the following video tutorials on heat treatment of steels. The Jomini test is widely used in the industry as a reliable incoming inspection of delivered materials, not least because of the ease of execution and the low scatter of test results. Although hardenability tests allow predictions to be made about the hardening behavior of real components, they must be supplemented by tests on the workpieces. Thank you for watching. I hope you'll be back to watch our next video tutorial.